so we are finally back into our study of the tabernacle. We've um, had a couple of sessions on this. We kind of did an introduction and then, um, I don't even remember how long it was ago, I think three, four weeks ago, uh, kind of started to, to dig into the Ark of the Covenant. And then I was on vacation and Fellowship Sunday and Fourth of July and all of that. So here we are again. Uh, and we're going to, we're still talking about the Ark of the Covenant. There's just so many things to, to uncover about that. And um, so today we're going to we talk a little bit more about, uh, about the Ark of the Covenant, particularly the mercy seat or the, the, the cover on top of the Ark of the Covenant. So I'm going to need um, a couple of, of references read. I need Exodus 25, 17 to 22 and Exodus 37, 6 through 9. So if there's any takers for that, any of uh, 20, 25, 17 to 22, okay, got it. and then Leslie, do you want to do 37, 6 through 9? I think there's some good, um, you know, biblical names in there like Aholiab and Bezalel and stuff like that to make it fun to read. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, the mercy seat. Uh, Olin, are you ready with Exodus 25, 17 through 22? Okay, 17 through 22. <clears throat> you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work. You shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two, two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Okay. Thank you. So that, those were the instructions that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. Remember, he was up there for 40 days, and he gave him in detail. And you can tell the detail you know, exactly how wide and how long and what direction the cherubim should be facing, etc. So he gave him all of those instructions. And then, um, Leslie, go ahead and let's read uh, 37, 6 through 9. This is when they're actually building it. Okay. He made the atonement cover of pure gold two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. Then he made two cherubim, one out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. He made one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. At the two ends, he made them one of one piece with the cover. The cherubim had their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim faced each other, looking toward the cover. Okay, so it sounds very similar. They were following God's instructions. And so they, it almost sounded like you were reading the same passage because they did it by the book, you know, or, or by, directly, you know, by God's instructions. So um, la when we last talked about the Ark of the Covenant, what was the main thing about the, the how, how was the, the main box, if you will, the main compartment of the Ark constructed? It was made out of wood overlaid with gold and we spent a while talking about the fact that they used acacia wood which was very unique had very unique properties it was very enduring um, resistant to pests and, and to water and then it was overlaid with gold and the, the significance of the ark itself being made of both wood and gold uh, the wood representing um, God's humanity so Christ's humanity that element of him and then the gold representing his deity so we have the this this ark, which is a type of Christ, and it represents that God was that Christ was both fully God and fully man, and how significant that is to us. Now we talk about the cover over the mercy seat, and what did Olin read in those instructions from God? It needed to be pure gold. So that's the first aspect of the mercy seat that I want to talk about today is the fact that it was made entirely out of gold. So not only um, does it reinforce 
God's deity, because now we've got this, this cover, which is entirely um, representative of, of the deity portion of, of God's um, uh, character. But it's also just something of great value on the human side of it, right? So I was trying to do some math this morning, um, figuring out, you know, I'm just trying to conceive of something that big of solid gold, okay? Can you imagine? So it says that it's the ark was one and a half cubits wide by two and a half cubits long. A cubit, according to Google, is about 17.49 inches, okay? So that means that it was about 26 inches wide, so about two foot two wide, and about 43 inches long. Okay, so that's over three feet long. So just imagine at least a two foot by three foot box. Okay, and this lid was of solid gold. And one thing we don't know is how thick it was. They, they, they didn't specify, you know, if this was just a, a, a thin plate. I can't imagine that it was. I, so let's just say for the sake of, of conversation that it was one inch thick. Could have been thicker. Could have been two inches. I don't know. And um, that much gold, that would be 1,612 square inches, cubic inches, rather, of gold, okay? What does that mean? Well, a cubic inch is 10.16 ounces, and an ounce of gold is $1,809 today. That means that the plate itself, just the base, would be worth over $21 million today just the base i'm not counting the cherubim because i don't even know how to do the math on that okay so this was not only um a, a, a spiritual piece it was literally the thing that was of greatest value in the israelite camp at the time i mean to have something of that great value made of solid gold and and um it was, of course, you would want to protect it, you know, and put it in a very special place, and um, of course, and it was put into the holiest of holies. So, um, the when we talk about the the ark, the ark represents the person of Christ, and the mercy seat represents His purpose. Okay, so um, nothing put, but deity could offer saving mercy. Um, I've got notes all over my place uh, today, so I'm going to kind of be flipping back and forth, so bear with me a little bit. Um, but but that's, the, that's the first aspect of this, is made of pure gold, so pure deity um, representing the, the atonement cover over the, the person of Christ um, that was inside. Now we'll talk about the dimensions. I already mentioned that it's one and a half cubits wide by two and a half cubits long. And the dimensions of the mercy seat exactly match the dimensions of the ark itself. Now there was a lip, or they call it a crown, that was around the top of the ark that the mercy seat sat down inside. Um, so, but the dimensions of the seat, the cover itself, were exactly the same. And um, one of the observations that that uh, one of the, the, the authors I was, I've been studying from said that represents that God's mercy is wide enough and long enough to cover anyone that abides in Christ. And I thought that was a really neat thought, a neat reflection that his mercy will come, it's, it's perfect. It fits it perfectly. It's just wide enough. It's just long enough. It's, it's exactly what we need. It's not there was didn't need to be extra hanging over, and it wasn't, you know, too small that had to have another rim of wood or anything to sh to shim it up. It's just right, and it's what it's what we need to cover us as we abide in Christ. So we've got it's made out of gold. It's the perfect size, and then um, I want to talk a little bit about those cherubim. Um, so one thing that really stood out to me in, in this study on the, on the mercy seat, and I, and I don't know if you, if you picked up on it from what Olin read, but the cherubim were made out of one piece with the, uh, with the mercy seat. So it says they were hammered out of, out of the mercy seat. They weren't cast in a, in a mold and attached to the mercy seat. 
They hammered it out of the mercy seat. It was all one piece. That blows my mind. I don't even know how you do that. I mean, I, I can't, I can't imagine that. Um, but you know, God, as He prepared these Israelites and gave them these commands, He gave them exactly the skills that they needed in order to accomplish this. It says in Exodus 37, 1 through 7, The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood, to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed him, with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, and I have uh, given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. So not only did he give them the instructions for exactly how he wanted his tabernacle to be built, but he gave them the skills to do it. So where I can't even fathom where to begin in hammering a two cherubim out of a plate of gold, he gave them those skills. So they knew exactly what, uh, what they needed to do and how to do it. The other thing about um, the, the kind of the correlation of, of the, these cherubim being made of one piece uh, with the mercy seat tell, uh, kind of um, links to some, some passages in the New Testament. If we go to John 1.3, uh, well, starting with John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 3 says, all things were made through Him. Um, and so here we have the ark, again, as a, as a type of Christ, and these cherubim that are coming up out of this mercy seat, all of one piece, and, and how much of a picture of that is, of how everything was made through him. And uh, we can see that again in Colossians um, chapter 1, 15 through 17. I probably should have assigned these out as well, so I'm not taking up time, but here we go. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were, cre were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So here we have this, uh, uh, again, ref a reflection of, of the mercy seat from the Old Testament, represented in Christ in the New Testament, how he created thrones. And what was the mercy seat? It was the throne of God. But yet God created all thrones. He created all rulers. He's the one that gave them the authority, and it was all created through him. And then the last thing is this, it says that the, um, the cherubim, not only were they created uh, as one piece with the mercy seat, but they were also, it was, it was hammered. It was hammered out. It was beaten out, it says um, in, in Exodus. And uh, who else was beaten but Christ? You know, be, being beaten represents suffering, and he was beaten for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And so all of that symbolism together, we have this reflection of Christ in the mercy seat um, that's made of pure gold that was um, fully God, and, and it represents just enough for us. So the cherubim... The, the cherubim are considered angelic be beings that uh, do God's bidding. They protect God's majesty. Um, the, fir the first time we see cherubim in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, where uh, after um, Adam and Eve had sinned and were cast from the garden, God put cherubim there in the garden uh, of Eden to protect the tree of life. Um, because it had been compromised, and, uh, the, and through sin, uh, they had taken part of that that they should not have taken. And so here we see cherubim protecting that, and, and now uh, they're on the mercy seat, but they're also in other areas in the Old Testament. We also, we'll, we'll get to this as we start talking about other parts of the tabernacle, but there were images of cherubim 
woven into the veil that separated the holy place and the most holy place. And there were also cherubim woven into the, the uh, coverings around the inside walls of the tent. So cherubim were a significant um, uh, representation throughout the Old Testament. They also see, looking ahead into the temple, there were two cherubim that were carved out of olive wood and they were put into the temple around the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and then fast forward, way forward, past the present and into the future in Revelation, we hear about cherubim again being around the throne of God. So these are, are symbols of uh, beings that are protecting God's majesty. They're guarding his holiness. And, um, and we see that in, um, in, in the mercy seat. And it says that the cherubim were facing each other and looking down on the mercy seat with their wings outstretched. And what was inside the mercy seat? What did we talk about last time? The law. Um, so the tablets of the law uh, were inside uh, the mercy seat. So if you can imagine with me that here's these cherubim who are looking down on the law that's inside. And what did the law do? It, it's what condemns us. It's what we break all the time. We are constantly... Uh, uh, violating the law that God gave us and gave to the Israelites. And yet, now here's where the mercy seat came into practice. Once a year, the priests would go into the holiest of holies and they would take the blood of the sacrifice and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And that is what um, would give them atonement, if you will. It would, we would wash away their sins. Okay, so as God was looking down from his throne on the mercy seat, he was looking through that blood and it covered their transgressions against the law. And that was when forgiveness could be offered. All right, so it's not hard to make the leap that who is, you know, we know the, rep the mercy seat represents Christ and it was his blood that ultimately gave us the atonement that um, he gave his blood so that we don't have to sprinkle a mercy seat anymore. Uh, he he uh, fully atoned for our sins. And in fact, in, uh, in Romans, well, we're all familiar with uh, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But as you read a couple verses later in Romans 3.25, it says that he was the propitiation for our sins. Well, that's a $10 word, but it basically just means atonement. And, um, and the translation of that word propitiation in the Greek is also translated as mercy seat. So he was literally saying in Romans chapter 3, Christ is our mercy seat. And it's his blood that atoned for the sins of the whole world. Um, and then the, the last thing is that um, the... The mercy seat was the was where God would reside. So that's where his presence dwelt. And throughout the Old Testament, we have multiple references to the presence of God. Um, but it was um, it, it would he would appear in a different form, right? So a lot of times uh, God's presence was in a in a kind of a fiery, uh, like the tongues of fire, the pillar of fire that the Israelites followed in the wilderness, or in a cloud um, that they followed by day. And it says in Leviticus um, chapter 6 that, that he would, or 16 to, the Lord appears as a cloud on the mercy seat. So they never got to see God, but they saw his presence in, in kind of a um, non-corporeal form. Okay, and, um, and there's about six or eight or ten different references throughout uh, the Old Testament of God appearing to people in this way. So that was how God um, represented himself to, in the Old Testament. And then we had um, Christ who came to earth, and he was Emmanuel, God with us. So that's when we had God actually amongst us, visible, physical. You could touch him, and he was truly God with us. And then as uh, Jesus ascended into heaven, he said, um, I will um, send you another. 
and he sent us the Holy Spirit. So that's God's presence with us today. It's in every one of us. Now there's no need for an ark, uh, a, a, a mercy seat, or any other intervention because we have God in, indwelling in us through the Holy Spirit. And how did God, how did the Holy Spirit first appear to those uh, Christians in the New Testament? Tongues of fire, a hail back to the image of God in the Old Testament, the pillar of fire where he, he guided the Israelites through the wilderness. His Holy Spirit came in the same way. Uh, to almost put a little exclamation point on, yeah, this is the real deal. This really is my uh, repre representation of God for you um, from this point forward. So... Um, the thing, the, those, those characteristics of the mercy seat, it was made of gold. It was the exact same dimensions as the ark. Uh, it it um, had the cherubim that were made of one piece with, with the, the cover. Uh, it was this it was sprinkled with blood, and we have Christ's blood taking its place, and, it has, and then it was the presence of God. Um, I think that all of those things combined just make it unmistakable, the picture that that even then God was trying to portray to the Israelites and to us centuries later that I have been with you in the, I've been with you from the beginning. And it just, to me, reiterates Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was the same representation to the Israelites in the wilderness as he is to us today through the Holy Spirit in our lives and through the atonement that we received through Jesus. So I um, hope that that gives you some, some more in-depth thoughts and then maybe, maybe another way to look at the, uh, at the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. Any, any comments or questions? All right, well, we've run out of time. Let's close in prayer. Lord, uh, thank you for, for the gift of your son, that, that he was our Mercy Seat, that he brought atonement. Thank you for the image that you've given us uh, th through the Israelites of the mercy seat and of, of the, the plan that you had for our salvation from the very beginning. Help us to, to keep that in mind and to know that you do have a plan. You have each one of our lives mapped out and you know uh, where we need to be and, and what we need to do and you've sent the Holy Spirit to help us do that. I pray that you'll be, be with each person that's here today, that you would walk with them this week and help them to have a great week. Keep everyone safe. We thank you for it. In your name, amen. Amen.